Well, artificial intelligence has been around for a while, but it seems like 2023 was the year that it took over as our primary focus when thinking about the future of business and other aspects of our lives. Christian Turwish is a co-director of the Mac Institute for Innovation Management. He is also professor of operations, information, and decisions here at the Wharton School, and he joins us here in studio. Great to see you. Thanks for having me here. How do you process all that we have seen and talked about around AI this year? It's been a crazy year. So if you think back to the fall of 2022, when ChatGPT came out, it started off as something that we thought of primarily the kids would use to get their homework done. And it took the world by storm. At the same time, we had uh, DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, do amazing work in, in the text-to-image world. And with GPT-4 launch, the, the large language models got even better. It's been a hell of a ride. I would imagine it's probably not even a surprise to you to see how it has kind of enveloped the thinking of so many businesses over the last year as well. So I think we had a big jump in progress. I think technological progress doesn't typically follow a continuum. There are these what we call punctuated equilibria, these moments when there are big shifts. And I think we have seen this massive shift that go beyond what companies expected. And I, uh, lots of companies we work with at the Mac Institute are now thinking about getting ready for the changes and retooling, so to say, now that a new tool is available. Is this going to be uh, a, a path that all businesses will be able to take advantage of? I think the expectation is obviously larger companies that have the resources will easily be able to do this. But I guess my question is more about what about the midsize and small businesses and how they may be impacted by this so that they're not necessarily left out? I think it's actually the opposite. I think this change that we have seen is going to lead to a democratization of AI. It used to be that you have to be a big company to have the, the big data, the, the huge data set that you use to train your AI yourself. And I think thanks to the GPT technology, basically their training is it's pre-trained now. And so right out of the box, uh, a one-person startup can create a, a kind of a cool app uh, and provide solutions to needs that are currently unmet. So I think it helps the small guys. The one thing that we have seen with the updates of uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI's work is, of course, that every time that they come out with a re new release, thousands of these small ventures that were about to take off are wiped away because their functionality is baked into the next generation. But I, I don't think it is giving the big guys an unfair advantage. It feels almost a little bit like we're in a process right now where it's like when we get an update for our smartphone or you know have to update our, our, uh, our, our security uh, on our computer right now, that it's coming at that speed almost. Unbelievable, right? You go from 3.5 to 4 to Turbo, Dali gets integrated, I mean, all in one year after, again, there's been progress in AI for, for, for many decades. But uh, the last year, it seems to have hit the mainstream, both on the availability of the techn uh, te technological solution capabilities, but also now I think the awareness of what it can do in enterprises, where we can use it to create value. You and I had talked uh, many months ago when you had done research around uh, the impact of AI on uh, it uh, trying to pass an MBA test. Uh, how has your thinking around the use of AI in the education setting developed over that time as well? So the first thing I think most of us do now is if we have an exam that is kind of a traditional exam, uh, ben, GPT, ben GPT, right? I mean, it's, it's too good. It passes every exam. You can't figure that out or detect that. At the end of the day, we at the Wharton School want to give, give degrees to students and not to, to software. Having said this, uh, I have in my operations course just kind of created the new first new assignment where I explicitly asked students to use GPT to help them sort through massive and complex data. Uh, I have in my innovation course where we start new ventures and come up with kind of ideas on new products and services. I urge my students to use ChatGPT to generate ideas. And even in something as benign as looking at my teaching evaluations where we get lots of verbal comments, I just put this into GPT and say, like, summarize this and make three recommendations of what I should improve next year. And it's pretty good. 
but so you don't have a negative viewpoint on it at all. It's very much a positive, uh, you know, and, and the benefits it can pr provide viewpoint. Well, maybe that is wishful thinking, but okay. I mean, we don't have a choice, right? But I think, look, if all we did is we would go back to a world where we did not have this technology, uh, it would be a waste, right? This is a huge opportunity for many professions, education, healthcare, uh, and many others of really dealing with the big problems. I mean, a lot of jobs, uh, Folks are burning out. Folks are working. I mean, we had, we had a meeting with the American Institute on board last night. Uh, folks from Penn Medicine were there. Uh, the burnout rate of f providers of people working in medicine is huge. We need to help these people. And so if you if you give me a, a, a magic wand that makes me a 50% productivity improvement, I take the wand. So you just talked about, uh, about impact. Uh, one of the areas of impact that has been brought up is, is AI going to eventually take jobs away? But there has also been a focus on how AI can support the efforts of a lot of people uh, in the workplace. Absolutely. Right? Which way do you think it's going to go? No, I think uh, both, right? I mean, so there will be jobs that will change. I mean, basically, any job to be done, there is a customer who needs something. There is a provider that provides a solution, and they have to do this in a way that value is created, so that means the customer is willing to pay more than it costs to generate the solution. So now, first order effect is you have AI generates a solution which is much cheaper than the human-generated solution, and so lots of people will have to change their jobs. But second order, there are lots of things that right now make no economic sense of doing unmet customer needs that we with AI can fulfill which means they're, they're new jobs. And which way that goes, I don't think anybody knows. I, I know you've also taken a look at, at AI in the scope of entrepreneurism as well. How does that impact being an entrepreneur moving forward? So I think one of the great uses of AI is as a form of a brainstorming partner. We, we still see hallucinations in AI. We don't think, uh, we don't have the, the trust in the technology yet where we would say like drive my car or uh, manage my retirement portfolio. The nice thing with entrepreneurship and idea generation is you give me 100 ideas. Even if 99 of those 100 ideas are horrible, as long as there's one good one in the middle, I, I take that portfolio. And so I think that startup aspect of generating ideas for dissertations, for cancer research, for entrepreneurship, that part of creativity we can enhance now. And that's, that to me is a no-brainer. I take that any time. You bring up something interesting as well because uh, there are still calls to maybe slow down the implement, implementation of AI so that we truly understand what the impact is. Where do you fall on that, on that question? I mean, it's uh, probably in our lifetime the biggest game changer that we've seen in history. I think you and I have been around for the, the internet becoming a yeah. big thing, right? Yeah. Then mobile came. I think this is probably the biggest thing in our lifetime. Uh, so it's really hard to predict, right? I mean, you see people making the argument for super intelligence and that, that the robots will rule the world. Smart people argue so. Uh, I think. There are lots of things we regulate in our society. Uh, that is a good thing. Uh, you're you're not, not allowed to build a nuclear bomb in your backyard. And again, that's a good thing. So it would be shocking if we would leave this space as totally unregulated. I think what is especially concerning here is that if you're building an atomic bomb, it took the Manhattan Project over 100,000 people to build an atomic bomb, right? I mean, that's something that you and I, even with evil intent, couldn't do in our sure. backyard. Yeah. Uh, you jailbreak a, a, a smart AI system, uh, it could do horrible thing. It will, it will only take one offender. And so I think some form of security, some form of regulation, absolutely. Is your expectation then it, that the next couple of years we'll see even greater impact from, from things like chat GPT moving forward? I mean, the first order of forecasting is extrapolation, right? I mean, you basically sure. extrapolate the line and uh, that suggests that we're going to see ma massive progress. It's not going to stop tomorrow, right? So we're going to see massive progress. How long this famous discussion of AGI, super intelligence, how far we are away, uh, nobody knows. 
So certainly, I don't know, but I think that is more philo more of a philosophical. But it it still feels like from all that's happened and, and with the potential impact of this technology now, you know, in our laps, that it feels like it's still a little bit of the tip of the iceberg, doesn't it? Yes, and I think again, it will not stop if you even for just another one or two years you apply some form of extrapolation of the trend that we've seen over the last years, uh, we're gonna have J.K. Rowling level writing come out of ChatGPT. We could imagine the context window has just grown substantially. We could imagine much better science papers and dissertations be generated by ChatGPT. I don't think it takes much of a crazy assumption to imagine a world in four or five years where a lot of these things become true. From a business perspective, then, one of the things I wondered is, does this drive even a greater focus on what productivity will be in the future with employees and getting projects done? Because you will have this component as an assistant to be able to get a lot of this work uh, done in a quicker fashion, but also potentially in a, in a more concise fashion as well. I'm a big fan of productivity. It sounds totally boring, German operations management type of boring. Uh, but again, think about professions such as healthcare. Think about educators. We need to make them more productive to improve their quality of life and have healthier patients and smarter children. And I think the, the, those productivities, uh, it's up for us as a society what we do with these productivity gains. And I very much hope that we use them for better education and better treatments as opposed to for lower costs of healthcare and schools. So you mentioned earlier about the element of stress that a lot of companies are dealing with in healthcare as well. Are there other avenues that, that the hospital industry is watching closely where they think that AI will be able to, to provide a benefit moving forward? I think in the news, the stories that, that reported is the capabilities of AI to help with the diagnosis, right? It, it can read uh, in image to text, it can read x-rays, it can, uh, I'm working on a project on mental health right now, where it can do pretty decent diagnostic assessments. Uh, I think we forget how much of the, of, of the life, in a, a day of the life in the worker, in healthcare nurse or provider, how much that is writing notes, reports, keeping track of medical records. Yeah. I think a lot of that can be freed up, and I think that's a much lower hanging fruit. It's less glorious, it's less sexy to talk about, yeah. but I think that's where the first line of attack is gonna be. But I would imagine that it, it, it's partially benefiting in, a, in an area like healthcare from the fact that the healthcare industry has already kind of made a transition to technology to begin with, and so this is the next step in the process. A absolutely, I, I come from Germany, my parents live in Germany, at care in Germany, unbelievable how this system is still paper-based and years behind. We have had lots of people joke and complain about the transition to the electronic health record. It's been uh, the right thing, and I think we're gonna see massive rewards from that. What are you most interested to watch or potentially see occur next year in and around this area? I think next year I wanna see how we speaking for myself, how we go from cool projects of, guess what, it can do that, towards really uh, implementing uh, at the bedside or in, at the school bench, implementing systems that lead to better outcome. I think we, we urgently need it. And this is gonna be that next phase of learning for so many of the younger generations is how AI can complement a lot of what we do as we, you know, as we are growing up and going out into the world. Yeah, and I mean, many years ago, you and I had discussions about MOOCs, right? Massive sure, open online courses. Right. I mean, we were 10 years younger. <laughs> yeah, right? I but, forgot about that, yes. And so there uh, we were saying how the MOOCs will disrupt everything. But what we couldn't do was a video-based teaching is that personalized uh, tutoring. Yeah. And that, I think, is a major strength that we have the technology now. Every kid can be picked up where he or she stands and be coached. And again, I'm in no way implying that we don't you need human workers, teachers to right. do this, right. but we can customize the education 
to an extent that we could not do this before. And I think I very much hope that this overcomes a lot of the quality discrepancies around schooling. The OECD just this week re released a PISA report with horrible report cards on math and science for many of the developed nations. Kids have not recovered from COVID in the classroom. The, the test results are horrible. And so, again, we need that technology. We need that productivity boost and shouldn't be scared of it only by putting it into this kind of, it's going to steal our jobs. Christian, great to talk with you. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Christian Terwish, who is uh, co-director of the Mac Institute for Innovation Management and also professor of operations, information, and decisions here at the Wharton School.